it's worth reminding ourselves that, that of course, one of the, the great promises of Brexit was all these new trade deals that we were going to do, which simply hasn't happened. It didn't happen with the Americans. The Australian deal was denounced by George Eustace him, himself, who, the man who'd been partly responsible for, for negotiating it. When Fletcher Christian and the bounty mutineers fled the British Empire, they went to Pitcairn Island. And this act has assumed a recent great importance because Pitcairn is the last remaining British territory in the Pacific Ocean and gives us the right to participate in the new Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. Joining this has been greatly celebrated by the advocates of Brexit as a success and a vindication of their project. I'm talking today with Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust, uh, about this. Brendan, what is your take on the uh, decision to join the CPTPP? And what is its significance? I think its significance has been grossly, bizarrely overstated by the advocates of Brexit. There's a reason for that. Um, the Brexit narrative is falling apart daily as we look at it. Uh, and there are a number of flaws, fundamental flaws in the agenda, which are now being revealed. And yet, uh, it, with a bit of, um, of uh, goodwill, a bit of uh, stretching of the facts, perhaps a little bit of fantasy and exaggeration, uh, this participation in the Trans-Pacific Partnership can be presented as being a, a delivery on some of the promised elements of Brexit. Um, we'll go through the elements of that and, and show that they're they're not realistic, um, but it's because the partnership appears to tick some of the boxes of the promises of the referendum in 2016 that it's being talked up with such enthusiasm by the advocates of Brexit. The, the principal notion is that uh, the future uh, growth area in the world economy is in Asia, uh, that Europe is in terminal decline, and that by Going into this partnership, Britain is now linking itself to these um, economies of the future. Uh, is that a, a reasonable proposition? Uh, I mean, can this deal compare in any way to what we had when we were members of the European Union? No, it's it's magical thinking. It's the idea that somehow by being associated with dynamic economies uh, on the other side of the world, um, that will of itself turn the United Kingdom into a dynamic economy. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it's true that uh, Asian economies will come over the uh, over the decades to, before us um, to occupy a, a larger proportion of the world's GDP, um, and that's excellent. And we should have good trading relations with them. Um, but the comparison between the likely economic spin-off from being in this partnership and the loss that we're suffering from being in Brexit um, is is gigantic. Um, uh, at a recent interview that I saw, Kemi Badenoch was reluctant to mention the well-known figure of 0.08% as a supposed benefit from the partnership um, because it, it compares so unfavorably with the 4% of loss, uh, which is uh, all experts um, accept is the direct consequence of our leaving the European Union. Uh, the thought that Europe is entirely in decline um, is, is not one that can be sustained. Um, high standards of living and political stability are on, on offer in the great majority of, of Europe. Um, if we look at Germany, France, Italy, Spain, th these are highly successful, um, democratic and productive countries. The thought that the United Kingdom somehow uh, can emancipate itself from the European tradition and European values and European ways of doing things is, is simply fantastical. Some people have linked this uh, to the trade, uh, the deal with Australia uh, over um, nuclear submarines and the strategic alliance with the Americans uh, in confrontation with China. And of course, the, the, the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership was in some respects originally conceived as a way of containing China in Asia economically. And what is the geostrategic element in this? A selling point, a supposed selling point of Brexit, was the idea that the United Kingdom will be able to extend its geostrategic reach. Um, supposedly, it was cribbed and confined by being in the European Union. Of course, it was the other way around, that, that um, 
Britain, the United Kingdom has suffered a, a catastrophic loss of prestige and, and, um, and the ability to be taken seriously by, by Brexit and, and, and what, what it's brought about. Um, but I think the, the idea that joining the partnership is somehow going to uh, leverage up uh, the United Kingdom, the global standing, particularly in the Pacific uh, region, is, is, is once again uh, fant fanciful. Um, I'm not sure that the United Kingdom has a, a clear view of the relationship that it wants to have with China. On one level, it wants to be a, a favored economic partner, it appears, of China. And on the other le level, it wants to um, be close to the Americans in their, in their uh, unease uh, about the development of, of a, uh, a rival in the Pacific in, in the form of, of, of China. Uh, but I also think there's a further point uh, the idea that the United Kingdom is going to turn up in this partnership and somehow dominate it and uh, be able to use it and bend it to its will uh, as an instrument of geopolitical um, strategy making, I, I, I think is, is, is hopeful to say the least. Um, uh, there are important players already within this partnership, um, the Japanese, the Canadians, the New Zealanders. Um, they are not sitting around waiting for a lead from Britain. Britain will have to take its place uh, within um, the, the organization. It, it won't by any means be the most powerful voice within the organization. How can it be being located geographically on the other side of the world? One element that has been um, highlighted in, in this discussion uh, with relation to China is the suggestion that the UK being members of this uh, partnership um, could be in a position to prevent China from joining it, because there has been suggestions that the Chinese might be interested in joining the CPTPP. Uh, but another angle of that is that uh, our joining it prevents us from rejoining the EU. Uh, is that true? Um, it's not true at all. Uh, if we decided we wanted to rejoin the European Union, we'd rejoin the European Union. The fact that um, uh, so soon after leaving the European Union, we're able to join the partnership suggests that there's not an, an enormous disparity between between the two systems. No, the reason why the Brexiters are talking about this um, is that they realise um, that the hope that Brexit would commend itself on its merits to the United Kingdom's electorate um, has proved to be to be fatuous, to be to be futile. Um, instead of saying. Uh, we're not going to rejoin the European Union because Brexit has been such an enormous success. Um, they're now desperately reduced to advocating poison pills, which supposedly make it um, difficult, if not impossible, to rejoin the European Union. Uh, if we manage to leave the EU, um, we can manage to leave the partnership. It, it may even be, be easier than we think. Um, it might be that we could have our cake and eat it. It might be that it could be the easiest trade deal ever in human history. Who knows, perhaps they need us more than we need them. This whole discussion about the supposed benefits of uh, our joining uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership uh, is part of a wider picture that the uh, those advocates of Brexit seem uh, ready to um disguise the the uh, downside that we are suffering and the the relatively paltry uh, advantages that we are achieving from this uh, arrangement um and, and this extends this attitude and uh, trend of deception uh, seems to uh, be more extensive i mean it is it, it, we see it in in other areas we see it just recently in this whole connection over over uh, the problems at dover uh, the reluctance to admit what is obvious to anybody, that um, the huge queues there are due to um, 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 departing the European Union. Yes, it, it is part of, uh, of, of a larger picture. Um, but it's worth reminding ourselves that, that of course, one of the, the great promises of Brexit was all these new trade deals that we were going to do, which simply hasn't happened. It didn't happen with the Americans. The Australian deal was denounced by George Eustace itself, him, himself, the man who'd been partly responsible for, for negotiating it. Um, but that feeds into, a, 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 as you say, a, a larger picture um, of pretending that the black is white, of, of denying the um, the, the obvious um, downsides of Brexit. Um, uh, very interestingly, Sunana Brahman um, 
was uh, contradicted by number 10, which did admit that Brexit played a role in the congestion uh, in Dover. Um, but uh, I think that uh, the picture of, of, of the implications for Bre of Brexit for British political culture um, uh, is a very, very bleak one indeed, um, because it's been a, a retooling of British society and economy, both externally and internally, based on, on lies and fantasy. That's created a, a, a culture of a, estrangement from the truth, estrangement from reality, um, that it's possible to say anything um, and get away with it because you may well not be challenged by um, by um, uh, by the courtier journalists. Uh, and mo moreover, um, you won't suffer politically either internally in terms of your party or, or externally in terms of, of your political career. It, it, it's a, a very sad position. Um, another example of this is the retained EU legislation bill, which apparently is still going through. Um, Rishi Sunak uh, has um, committed, recommitted himself to it. Um, and that is a, 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 a vandalism, a, a, an iconoclasm, uh, which we, we don't normally associate or haven't normally associated with the Conservative Party up till now. Um, Brexit is, is a cancer, um, which is um, estranging our politics and our political culture from real reality and consistency. And it's a, a very worrying situation. Just coming back to the uh, pivot towards Asia that uh, this entails, what is strange to me in this is that it seems to reveal an underlying pessimism about uh, the future among Brexiteers, that this sense that Asia is the future, that um, Europe and the West in some respects is in uh, decline, and that uh, the arguments that you find in the establishment in the United States that uh, America must resist, particularly uh, the strength of China on the world stage, and in the establishment of the European Union, that in many respects the European Union was created in order to prevent European decline, but through unity, uh, Europe would be stronger. Britain's departure from, from both these ways of thinking is rather striking, particularly since uh, part of the idea of Brexit was to mirror more closely American geostrategic thinking rather than European. Whereas in this grander picture, the European establishment and the US establishment seem to be more or less ad item, and we are the outlier. I think it's difficult to, to depict one single philosophy of Brexit. Uh, one of the problems about it is that, that it's the result of a, a number of different and sometimes conflicting philosophies. Uh, one philosophy that you talk about is exactly that, um, that Europe is in terminal decline. But the hope is that somehow the United Kingdom will be able to save itself um, from this um, this ship. Um, I hesitate to talk about rats leaving shinking, sinking ships, but certainly that is the idea. Um, that somehow the United Kingdom can isolate itself from the contagion of Europe. Now, th this is all, all nonsense. Um, of course, Asia, over the coming decades and centuries, is going to play a larger role in the world's economy. Uh, it's a, 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 a good thing. Um, if the, um, there's a greater balance between the co economic development of various parts of the world. Um, but to go from that to saying that Europe is in terminal decline is, is absurd. Um, in continental Europe, um, people are uh, highly productive, in many cases more productive than they are in this country. Um, they live in, in civilised, well-ordered societies um, with good welfare states and a equality pursued by governments as a, 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 as a, a goal in itself. Uh, there is a, a philosophy espoused by the late um, um, Nigel Lawson, um, which is a more market-oriented philosophy, um, which is one which is more tolerant of, of, of inequality. Um, I don't think that that's a, a view that commends itself to most people in the United Kingdom. I think uh, it was striking that during the referendum, there was the claim that more money would be available for the National Health Service. Um, uh, governmental services provided for the benefit of the citizen um, are what um, the, the British electorate on the whole wants. They, they don't want um, Singapore on Thames. Uh, and I think that uh, as it be has become clear 
But for some of the advocates of Brexit, that was the, the be all and end all of Brexit in order to clear the way for a more radical market liberal uh, model of society in the United Kingdom. Um, so the popularity of Brexit ha ha has declined. Well, Brenda, thank you very much for this. I think we've uh, covered some interesting ground and doubtless we will be continuing uh, these discussions in due course. Thank you very much.